we'd like to welcome you to worship today, and we want to make a few announcements before we start our worship, just to let you know. We really appreciate those of you who were part of Backpack Pals. That went great this summer, being a part of that with the school system and getting food to folks in need through uh, the summer months. And that ended here this week at the end of the month, and we thank, we're thankful for all of you who participated in that. Uh, we also, though, want to let you know about a couple other needs in the community. On Saturday, August the 8th, the Baptist men will be building a ramp, and if you would like to be a part of that, Larry Wilson or Greg Matthews will be your contacts, and you can contact them about how you can help with that. That's on Saturday, August the 8th, and if you need more information, you can also contact the church, and we can help you get in touch with them. That's for Larry Wilson and Greg Matthews. We also want to let folks know that Bread of Life is running a cooling station during these hot days where folks can come and get a cool uh, water and uh, hygiene items as well. So if you can provide either of those, you can either leave them at Bread of Life between 1230 and 530, uh, Monday through Friday at uh, 209 Maple Avenue, where Bread of Life is, Old McKeever School. Excuse me, it's 219 Maple Avenue. Um, or you can leave them here at the church, and we will get them to Bread of Life. So be in prayer for those folks as they minister in these hot conditions uh, trying to help people out through the summer months. Uh, we also want to remind you um, that, to pray for Donna Stutz. She's at home after the surgery that she had that went well. So be in prayer for her and continue to pray as we go through these adjustments in worship. We're thankful that you're here with us. And I want us to start off with some scripture from Psalm chapter 66. It says, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. And all the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for the chance to worship today. And we pray that when we worship, we'll sing praises to your name, glorify your name, seek to draw closer to you through these times of worship. We pray for, Lord, these that we've mentioned in prayer. We pray for the ministering there at the Bread of Life and uh, that uh, wheelchair ramp. And we're just so thankful for people who are out working and uh, for others and, and glorifying your name through that work and bringing a comfort to those who are struggling, Lord. And we pray, Father, for a conviction on our hearts to be an honor and service to you and worship to you through this time. Help us to understand your word. In Christ's name, amen. Let's worship together. Let's start out by singing, standing on the promises of God. Friend, there's no, there's no better place to stand than on his promises.
Thanks for joining us uh, today. Take your copy of God's Word and turn to Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2. We've made our way through uh, Habakkuk chapter 1 and beginning today with Habakkuk chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verse 1 through 4 uh, here in just a, a moment as we talk about uh, conversation with God. This, this conversation that uh, Habakkuk is having uh, with God, some questions he has, some answers he has as we look at these uh, verses today. So turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. As you're turning there, a couple of weeks ago, our family went uh, out to, um, uh, to eat, and it's really one of the first times that we've been out to eat at a restaurant uh, during all of the COVID stuff that has, has happened. And uh, we walked into really one of my favorite uh, restaurants, and it was something I was eager to, to be there, and I was ready. To, I could kind of taste it in my, my mouth already. I was excited about eating there. Walked in uh, the restaurant and uh, said, you know, walked up to the hostess and said, you know, it's going to be a party of uh, however many we had with us, five or six of us. And uh, they said, it's going to be a 45-minute wait. 45-minute wait, and in my, my heart just kind of sank because I knew in my mind, I was like, I don't want to wait 45 minutes, even for this, uh, this great restaurant and this food that I love and this, uh, 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 I haven't eaten here in so long, I was so excited about it, but I wasn't willing to wait 45 minutes for it, and so we went somewhere else, and of course, no fault to them, they were uh, trying to to keep uh, every other table and half capacity and all those things that they have to do, so it was no fault to them. But it was me. It was I was not willing to wait. I don't know if you you may have found yourself in that uh, situation uh, over the past uh, month or so. Uh, but I know all of us. I don't know. It, it must be something that happened in the fall uh, with us as human beings that we just don't like to wait. We are impatient human beings, and waiting is not anything that we uh, enjoy doing, like to do. And most of the time, we won't do it. We'll go do something else. Go somewhere else. So what happens when we? as impatient human beings, have to wait on God. 
What, what, what do we do when, when we ask, as Habakkuk has asked a question of God, uh, um, uh, uh, having doubts and things that, on his mind and heart that he wants to, to ask of God, or when things that, uh, that we pray for, that there's, there's uh, something that we're praying for that uh, just doesn't seem that God is listening or that he's going to answer, or we have a question that it seems that we just can't ever find the answer to and, and hearing from God. We're maybe seeking him about a certain decision, and it's like he just never seems to answer or open the right uh, door. How do we do that? How do we wait on God? Well, we're going to see today in these verses some insight from Habakkuk about how he waits to hear from God. So I want to just read these verses to you, and and then we'll jump right in. In Habakkuk chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run, for the vision is, is yet for the appointed time, it hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. As we kind of read that section out of chapter 2, I want to kind of bring you up to speed if you haven't been with us before, or just to kind of let you know where, where we're at. When we saw verse one, or sorry, chapter 1 of Habakkuk, we found uh, Habakkuk in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 1 asking questions of God like, Where are you, God? Why are you not listening to my prayers? Why is it that, that you seem to be so insensitive and idle when all this sin and blasphemy uh, and idolatry is going on all around him in the nation of, of Judah, that southern kingdom? And he kept saying, God, where are you? Why are you not answering? Why are you not doing something about the sin all around you? And then uh, he he seems to answer in those verses, verses 1 through 11, he tells Habakkuk, he says, watch, I'm about to do something that you're not going to believe. I'm not being idle. I am hearing your prayers. I'm behind the scenes. I'm working. I'm moving. I'm bringing all of this uh, to, to fruition according to my plan and to my will. And then as Pastor Tim talked about last week, um, uh, Habakkuk didn't like God's answer. Because God was saying, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans, also known as the Babylonians. I'm going to raise them up to judge you, to judge the nation of Judah, my chosen people. He said, I'm going to raise them up to, to judge them. And as Tim talked about last week, uh, Habakkuk didn't like that at all. And Habakkuk comes back with the question, as Tim talked about last week, why are you going to use this unrighteous people to come and judge your uh, chosen people and what he thought uh, righteous people before God? And then when we move into chapter 2, we see him in chapter 2. He's going to give Habakkuk this vision, answering his question of why he's going to do that and how he's going to do that. In fact, his, you know, in short, uh, what he's going to, going to tell him is he's like, don't worry about that, Habakkuk. I'm going to judge the Babylonians too. I'm going to, to judge the, the Chaldeans for their idolatry and for all of their sin uh, in their lives. Don't worry about them. Let me do that. And that's exactly what God does in 539 BC he brings the Medo Persians in uh, to Babylon and they take over and destroy uh, Babylon and, and take over uh, the kingdom there. And so that's what we're going to see in chapter 2. But right here in between that, while, while uh, Habakkuk is saying, Why are you going to do it and do it this way? Uh, I know that that's oftentimes a, a, a question that we ask God when he gives us the answer and shows us what he's going to do. We're like, well, I would do it a little bit differently than that. Or why are you doing it, doing it that way? Well, while he is waiting on God's answer that he's going to give him in chapter 2, the very few, first few verses of chapter 2 shows Habakkuk, so it gives us some insight today on how he waits on the Lord. And I think it's very insightful for us. What I want to do for you is I want to give you uh, four ways that that Habakkuk waits on the Lord uh, to help us 
to know how we are to wait on the Lord when we ask a question, when we are praying for a certain thing, or when we are, are, are seeking God's face and it just doesn't seem that it's happening as quick as we uh, would like it, it to. Uh, a couple of points that he gives us here to help us with that. So the first thing that I want you to see, the first uh, uh, point, the first help, the for, first insight into waiting on God's answer in our lives is he says to keep watch. That's what he says in verse 1 when he says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch. I will keep watch. So, so the first thing that we see here is he tells us that he is going to be a watchman uh, waiting on, on the answer for the Lord. And really this picture that he gives us is, is, is of a, a watchman, which was very common in, in Habakkuk's time and really in that time period. And in, in, in every kingdom or every city, there would be a watchman or, or many watchmen that would stand on the wall and they would look uh, and, and watch not only to to guard the city if someone came to attack the city, but also if uh, someone came with good news or maybe bad news about the battle or maybe waiting to announce the king and his entourage coming around the, the corner or out of the, out of the, the, the woods toward, the, uh, toward the, the city, he was there to watch and to announce news, good news, bad news, to wait for something to happen to announce to the, to the city, whether it was good or bad or, or whether it was something uh, that uh, was, was threatening or something that was coming that was going to encourage uh, the people. And that's what he says when he says, I'm going to stand on my guard post. I want you to kind of get a picture of this in your mind, standing on the guard post. He's guarding something at a post and he's standing there. He said, I, I will stand there where I am told to stand, where, where he, he was assigned to be. He was going to be obedient to the king or whoever was telling him to stand there and stand watch and he and he was not going to be moved by anything he said he was going to stand there and be immovable and even even when he got tired even when something was fearful or even when he didn't know or understand what was going on even when he got tired or bored or 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 or, or to try not to be distracted he was going to stand guard and even says he was going to station himself this is another another uh, picture here of being immovable on the ramp Part. Now, the rampart, in my translation, is the word it uses. It's basically just a huge wall of the city that was a defensive wall of the city that you could stand on. They oftentimes, oftentimes had defensive weapons up there. Watchmen would stand there, uh, again, to look for the en enemy to come or to look for, for, uh, uh, for the king to come or for, for something to, to, uh, to share with, with the people. So that's what he's saying. And in the same way for us, we're to stand watch waiting for God to speak and to move. To keep standing firm in obedience to Him. Trusting Him, even when we're tired, even when we're fearful, even when we don't understand, without being distracted by all the other things that distract us, without losing heart when it takes longer than we thought it, it would, or wondering if, if he's ever going to answer. I've talked to a lot of folks in, uh, in, in the military that, that I hear them talking about this idea of keeping watch, that a lot of times that they have to, uh, everybody in their, uh, in their battalion or platoon or whatever it might be called, or they are, uh, take their turn on watch. And it's, it's very similar to what, what Habakkuk's talking about. But one thing I think is interesting they talk about is sometimes, you know, it can get very boring or maybe they are, are, might be fearful that they might fall asleep on the job or that they might, might uh, get dis distracted uh, when they have a very serious and important job uh, to do. And I remember when uh, we were in D.C. a couple of years ago going to the tomb of, of the unknown soldier and just how what an amazing thing that is to watch those watchmen or those guards that, that uh, watch over and guard that tomb and the things that they go through uh, every day and every hour uh, out of respect and honor for these, uh, uh, for these uh, that have given their lives uh, for our country. But... It's, it was interesting when we were there to watch them and, and what they would do. But I remember when we were watching uh, them watch and, and do their thing, uh, someone dropped a water bottle and it like rolled out right there in front of 
the tomb. And it was amazing to watch them because they saw everything that was happening and everything that was happening in the crowd. And they saw that happening and they stopped everything that they were doing and they dealt with that one little thing that maybe we could have cared less about or we could have moved, uh, moved past. They, they saw that one thing and they had their, their own uh, uh, protocol with how they would deal with this water bottle that rolled out in front of the tomb. It's just interesting uh, to me the, this, this idea of a watchman and what he said that he was going to do. I'm going to stand. I'm going I'm to continue, even in this time of waiting, I'm going to continue to obey God and be where he wants me to be and do what he wants me to, uh, to do. And even though I'm waiting, I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to lose heart. I'm not going to give up hope of God answering and moving. I'm not going to be fearful even when I don't understand Beautiful picture for us. And then he tells us why. He tells us why he is waiting on the ramparts and standing guard. He says, to keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am repro reproved. So th this is very interesting. Why, am, why is he waiting? Why are we to wait? Uh, we just get a great picture into Habakkuk's heart here. First of all, he, he says why he is going to be a watchman on the wall is to see how God will answer. If you remember back in a couple of weeks ago in, in verse 5 of chapter 1 when, when he answered or when he asked God this question, why are you not listening to my prayers? Why are you not answering the issue of idolatry and sin in, in our nation? And what did he say in verse 5? He, he said, watch for I'm about to do something that you won't even believe. And so what, what he's doing here, thankfully, we see this progression in his heart here, is that he is, is waiting. Why is he, is he waiting? Because he, and why is he watching? Because God told him to. God told him to. He, sa he said, just like we talked about that surprise party that they had, uh, that they had forgotten. Some, you think they had forgotten about your birthday, but all the while they're planning this surprise birthday party for you. It's the same thing that God is doing here. He's telling us, don't get distracted by all the stuff all around you. Watch me and stay in my word and watch what I am doing. Don't miss what I'm going to do. Don't, don't, don't get so caught up in your doubts and your fear and your anger and all those things things that we oftentimes uh, feel and so we don't see God moving and working and what he's doing all uh, around us that's what he says he says I'm gonna watch I'm gonna watch why am I gonna be a watchman on the wall because God's told me to watch what he's gonna do and that's what I'm gonna do but then the secondly he says so I will know how to respond when corrected don't miss this this is really is really fascinating to me here he says there the reason he's gonna watch in the midst of his waiting on God to answer is is because he says when I am a pr he says I will he says, I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. You get what he's saying there? He, he's saying, I'm going to wait because, and while I'm, I'm waiting, I, I'm waiting to see how he is going to correct me. Have you ever had that attitude before God? Most of us have not had that attitude before anybody or even before God. But what a great attitude. Many times we come to God thinking that we're right and that God's wrong. We shake our fist at God and say, God, why'd you do it that way? I would have done it differently uh, than this. Or why, why, why? And he's saying, you see this progression again in his heart and what God's doing in his life. He's coming before God and he's saying, I'm open to God. God's correction I don't know everything but you do you are God I am not you see this this idea of, of waiting on God in humility and in trust and submission to who God is and what he's doing in the midst of of Habakkuk waiting so the first thing I want you to see there is is that he the, and what we're to do in the midst of waiting is to keep watch because he tells us to, and not to be distracted, but to stand guard, to stand watch in obedience to him, all the while waiting to say, God, show me what I need to do differently. Show me the, the attitudes and the, 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 the heart that needs to change and the sin that I need to get rid of while I'm waiting on you. Show me. 
I want you to correct me so that I can, can, can be right before you. What a great attitude. And the second thing that I want you to see here, the second thing that he gives us here as an example of how to wait is, is to prepare to share. Another way to put this is when God answers, or even in the midst of waiting, to share with other people. Listen to what I mean by that in verse 2. He says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tables that the one who reads it may run. Another translation says, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. So really what God, and here, God is beginning to answer uh, His question here in His waiting, but He he. He tells Habakkuk, and, and again, mind you that he is a prophet of God, so he's a little bit different than us, but the principle is the same, is he tells him, he says, I'm about to show you a vision, I'm about to show you, I'm about to answer your question, I'm about to show you what's going to happen to the Chaldeans, I'm about to, about to let you know what I'm going to do and, and why, uh, but, and so I want you to write this down. I want you to write it down plainly on tablets so that other people can read it, uh, not only in this time, in this day and time, but even us today, uh, a, a couple of thousand years later, uh, can read this and understand it. So write it down, write it plainly, and he even says, so that those that are, he uses the term runners in different translations, he says, so that it can spread. The point is, is that what God wants to do in your life, one of the reasons he's doing it is is so that is to be shared the whole reason one of the reasons that God gives us the word of God and the gospel is to share it so what we see here is God preparing uh, uh, Habakkuk in the midst of his waiting to share it When God moves in a situation, when He answers a prayer, when He answers a question we have, we must be willing to share that with others. Because this is what happens is when we do that, it allows others to be encouraged as well. Because I guarantee you, if you have that question, other people do. If you have that doubt, other people do. If you're praying for that thing, other people probably are as well. But it allows them to, to see uh, God working in and through your life. And it allows them to be encouraged that God can be trusted. That He is faithful. That He is working. That He is moving. But then above all of that, it allows God to get the glory. It's not just you that understands how, when God answers how great God is, but, it, but it, it also allows the whole world to, to know and to see how great God is. I mean, just think about for a moment if Habakkuk had just wrote that down and had not given it to anybody, or he hadn't written it down at all, or that nobody ever saw it, or even the rest of the Word of God for that matter. God gave His Word, even these prophecies, to be shared. And the same, the, the, the things that He does in your life today are the, are the same way for you to be shared. A good example of that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul talks about God being the God of all comfort. And he goes on to talk about why God wants to comfort you. And one of the reasons he says he wants to, to give you comfort or work in your, your life in this way is so that you can comfort those uh, that, that need to be comforted. So God wants to comfort you so that you can know how to comfort other people. Same kind of concept here. He goes on to say that he wants to comfort you uh, so that you can endure. So, so it's, it's a similar concept is that God works in our lives and does what he does, not only to do what he's going to do in our lives and those around us, but so that he can get the glory and so that we can know and other people around us can know who he is. So I want to, I want to challenge you to do that. And I, I will raise my hand to say I'm one of the worst at this, but, but I want you to, and, and I've confessed this uh, to you before, uh, but, you know, when... When you start praying for something and, and you're waiting, and I, I think every one of us could probably raise our hands and say that we're waiting on some, God to do something today, that we're praying for something that we want Him to do, or that we're asking a question of Him. But when you start doing that, when you start engaging with God in these conversations, involve other people. Go to that person in your life and say, man, I'm really struggling with this question. Would you pray with me about that? 
That's, that's preparing to, to share what God's going to do and even sharing what He's doing in your life. Or, man, I'm really praying that this person would come to faith in Christ. Would you pray with me uh, about this too? Would you pray with me for this person in my life? Or I'm really struggling with this or I really, I'm really seeking God about this. I'm really waiting to hear an answer from Him. Would you, would you uh, uh, pray with me? Would you walk with me through this? When we do that, what it does is it just spreads God's fame and His faithfulness and His glory and... Other people are encouraged because when God works and He answers and He moves, then they get to participate and, and, and experience that as well. They get to see God's faithfulness and, and, and His glory and His fame just spreads. And so keep watch and prepare to share as you wait. Involve others as you wait in praying and being a part of what God's doing. The third thing that I want you to see is to wait patiently. And I know you're saying, Matt, that's very redundant. Well, it is, but it isn't. Let me explain when I say that, that not only are we, we to be watchmen, watching, keeping watch, we're to prepare to, to share what God's going to do, but also we're to wait patiently. Now, waiting and waiting patiently are, are different, two different things. I want you to think about for a moment about a two-year-old in the line at the grocery store. Maybe you've experienced this from afar, or maybe you've experienced this up close and personal with your own two-year-old, but your two-year-old is in the grocery store with you or at some store, and you're waiting in line, and it's a long line, and they get very impatient and very upset, and they, may, they maybe even start hollering. They might even throw themselves on the on the floor that is not that is not wait that's waiting that's not waiting patiently many of us and like i said earlier most most all of us could raise our hands and say we're waiting in a period of waiting for some something for god to do whether it's something we're seeking god about or praying praying for but we we oftentimes are just like that two-year-old spiritually is we're waiting but we're not waiting very patiently we're waiting, but we're shaking our fist at God and saying, why or why not now? Or your timing is so not my timing. Or why are we, we get so angry and upset at God. And sometimes we even turn our backs on God. Or, or sometimes it, it causes us just to be bitter people. Or, or waiting uh, causes us to, to, to be ugly to other, to other people and, 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 and to be a bad witness for others. So we, we wait because we don't have any other choice a lot of times in our lives but we don't wait patiently. So that's what he's saying. He's saying to wait patiently. Let, let me, let me uh, uh, show you. He, he gives us in verse 3 a couple of reasons why we can wait patiently. Mark this down. I think this is really, really good stuff that Habakkuk gives us here. He gives us a couple of reasons why we can wait patiently. Really, God's giving it to him, I guess I should, is a better way to put it. In verse 3, look when it says, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Let me just give you a couple of little, a little nuggets of truth here about about why we can wait patiently on God. The first one is that it's going to happen in God's timing, and God's timing is, is, is perfect. That's what he means when he says, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. He's saying, Habakkuk, be patient, wait patiently, because I'm working this out. Uh, and for My timing is, is perfect for the appointed time. It will happen in God's timing. Be encouraged by that. Wait patiently, knowing that it's going to happen in, in, God's, uh, in God's timing. I was reminded as I was studying this about some missionaries that, that uh, were in, uh, in a former Soviet uh, republic, and it uh, was one that was closed off to Christianity for years. In fact, these missionaries were there probably uh, close to, to 40 years ago in this particular country. It's still a, a closed country to missionaries, but they were there. And all they did the whole, the whole 20-something years that they were there was pray. That's all they did was pray for that nation. That's all they did. They, they, couldn't, they, they could not share their faith legally without being thrown out of the country. It was very few times that they were even able to share their faith in the many years that they were there serving. And, and, and even the times that they were able to share, no one came to faith in Christ. I mean, wouldn't you be so discouraged about that? Wouldn't that be so difficult? But, but 
Now, and this, this is about 50 years later, that particular uh, 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 country is one of the places in the world with one of the fastest growing church planting movements in all the world. God had a plan in His perfect timing. It probably wasn't exciting to them at that moment. But if they could have seen and known that God was going to do something, a generation away from their prayers, He was going to answer them in a, in a way that, that's changing that whole country for eternity. It will happen in God's timing. So, secondly, he goes on to say uh, it, it hastens toward the goal. God does have a plan, and He's progressing toward it. Don't think God's being idle. Don't think that God is doesn't have a plan. He has a plan and he is progressing it. Every moment, every breath that we take on this, on this planet, he is doing that. That's what he says. He says, I'm hastening toward a goal. And then he says, it will not fail. God's word doesn't fail. If he says it, if he promises it, if he says it, it will come to fruition. Even when we pray and we're praying maybe separate from a promise, we know that he's hearing it and that he's working according to his will. It might not be exactly the way that we want it to turn out, but he is working even in our praying, even in our seeking him for his work, will and his glory in our lives. Be encouraged by that. The, the, the fourth thing that he says here, he says, though it tarries, wait for it. Again, he's saying patience is needed, Habakkuk. Be patiently waiting. And then, and then fifthly, he says, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Fulfillment is certain. It's going to happen. With, with Habakkuk's situation, they are, the Chaldeans are going to be judged. In your situation, God may, God may answer your prayer. He may, he may show you uh, today, or it may be 10 years from now, or it may not even be in your lifetime. Don't be so short-sighted. Don't be so impatient regarding God's plan in your life and for this world. We don't see the big picture. We only see what's right in front of us. But God sees the whole big picture. So, so he says, wait patiently. Don't just wait. A lot of times with God, you don't have a choice but to wait. But wait patiently. That's what he tells us. back. And then finally today, not only does he say to keep watch, not only does he say to prepare to share what God is going to do, he says wait patiently, but fourthly and finally he says live by faith. This, this verse I'm about to read you in verse 4 <clears throat> is really one of the key verses of the whole book of Habakkuk. It says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. That phrase, the righteous will live by his faith, is, is also mentioned three different times taken by New Testament writers into, into the New Testament. You can look at it in Romans. If you're taking notes, Romans chapter 1, verse 17 Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, and Hebrews 10, 38. All of those writers of the New Testament use this phrase from Habakkuk to make points about, about what Christ is doing and what he's done on the cross and, and the righteousness that he bestows upon us. But the point that, that I want you to see here with, with Habakkuk is that God makes a distinction between the proud and the righteous. The proud, which he says, have, have something wrong with their soul, and the righteous that live by faith. I think this is really an interesting point when we think about, about the, the distinction that God makes between human beings. It's not about the color of your skin. It's not whether you're rich or whether you're poor. It's not whether you're a, what, what a political party you're affiliated with. It doesn't matter if you're male or female or old or young. The distinction he makes between human beings are are they proud or are they righteous? That's interesting. That is fascinating and should be for us as followers of Jesus Christ and all that kind of is going on even in our nation right now and all that swirls around in our hearts and minds uh, from a political uh, uh, sense to a, to a biblical sense to a, a heart sense that God, the, the, the distinction he makes between people is between the proud and the righteous. 
One group which is proud and flowing toward destruction and God's judgment, and the other group by faith that is moving toward a right relationship with Christ and eternity with Him. Let's talk, let's talk about that for just a, just a moment, what, what we mean by that, because really that's, God's, that's the beginning of God's answer. Is that he's, assuring, he's assuring Habakkuk that, that the prideful, which includes the Chaldeans, but also includes some Judeans, that they will be judged for their sin and their idolatry, but those that humbly trust in God will gain their life, will walk with Him. It's important to understand what he means by that. So, so pride, when we're talking about pride, we're talking about believing that it's all about you. Don't we sometimes, and all, even whether we're willing to admit it or not, we think it's all about us. We think the world revolves around us. <laughs> we just, just think about the things that go through your mind and the way that we treat other people and the way that we, that we even come before God and the way that we, uh, that we live our lives. So many times it proves the fact of our fallen nature that we all think that it's all about us it's what pride is pride is thinking you're better than everybody else and sometimes including God arrogance the haughtiness it kind of oozes from our hearts so many times so something's wrong in your soul is the way that one translation puts it my translation says there's not right, something not right within him. But then he says the righteous. That means to be right with God at the base level. But it's something, especially this side of the cross, from a New Testament perspective, what, what righteousness is, is something God gives us through Christ that we don't deserve. We are not righteous. God is the only one righteous. Jesus is the only one righteous. But because of his sacrificial death on the, on the cross... It's called imputed righteousness, that He has justified us. He's made us right with God, even though we don't deserve it, but because uh, Christ is righteous and because of His sacrifice in our place, substitutionary atonement on the cross in His death and burial and resurrection. So it says the righteous will live by faith. Those that have been made right by God, through Christ Jesus. How do we live? We live by faith. To, to live, he simply means, he means we, we might use the phrase to walk with the Lord. To be obedient to Him and His Word. Again, he's not saying we've got to do that to be righteous. But he's saying this is what righteous people do. Not proud people, but righteous people. People that have been saved. People that have had their sins forgiven when they don't deserve it, and grace and mercy poured out upon uh, them, they live their life in obedience and faith. Faith is this pattern of trust in God no matter the circumstances, even when we don't understand, even when we don't get the answers that we want, even when there's doubts that go unanswered, even when we don't understand all that's going on, we continue to walk in faith. Such an important verse in the Word of God. In fact, it's this very verse, for Tom's sake, I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but just, I think it's really important that this verse really changed the course of church history. It was this verse back in the, in the 1500s that uh, the, the great reformer, Martin Luther, when, he, uh, when the Catholic Church was doing all that, he was, that they were doing, and he was disagreeing with that and trying to find, you know, what, what does the, the Bible really say? And he came across this verse, and he came across Romans 1.17 and Galatians 3, and some of these, these passages uh, that use this phrase, and it kind of dawned on him that we are saved not because we pay uh, we pay indulgences to the Catholic Church. We're not right with God because we work and work and try to be good and do the best that we can at everything that we can because we'll never reach righteousness. But he says, we, he, he, he says kind of a light came on in his mind that the righteous will live by faith. 
and it changed not only Martin Luther's life, but it was kind of this springboard for him and many of the other reformers that would totally change church history. And while we're really able to stand here or listen online to, to, today to, to the way that we're preaching today and, the, and, and evangelical Christianity that we experience today is because of this verse and those that would stand upon it. It's really important. And so my question for you uh, today is, do you struggle with pride? The question he, uh, when you think about this, the question he asked in chapter one, when he said, God, why are you not doing anything? Why are you not answering my prayers? Why are you so insensitive uh, to, to, to sin? Is that not a self-centered question when we really get right down to it? The questions he asked were not questions of, of righteousness and trusting in God, but of self-centeredness, as if the world revolved around him and that if he could see the whole picture when he could not. Even the question that he, that he asked in the remainder of chapter 1 when he said, why would you use this pagan nation to come and, and, and uh, 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 judge your righteous people? God's going to show him, and the, the question is, what an arrogant question. I mean, he was in the same boat the Chaldeans were. Yes, they were God's chosen people. They were just as idolatrous as the Chaldeans. They were just as sinful. It turned their back on God just as much as the Chaldeans had. But he thought that they were, he were, they were better than them in the eyes of God. God said, I distinguish between the proud and the righteous. I think it's great insight that Habakkuk gives us today because all of us are waiting. Habakkuk encourages us today to keep watch. Don't stop being obedient. Don't stop standing firm on the word of God. Keep watching and seeing what God's going to do. And then as, as, you, as you ask, as you as you. Um, Seek God as you wait. Would you prepare yourself? Would you involve other people? Because when God works and moves, I want to share it with other people. And then don't just wait. Wait patiently. Because He is working His plan in His perfect timing and in His perfect will. And in the meantime, let's live by faith. Let's not get so caught up in ourselves, but to live by faith, trusting in Him. I want to just close by reading a, a poem by Ruth Harms Calkin called, Lord, Could You Hurry a Little? It says, Lord, I know that there are countless times when I must wait patiently for You. Waiting develops endurance it strengthens my faith and deepens my dependence upon you. I know you are a sovereign God, not just an errand boy responding to the snap of my finger. I know your timing is neatly wrapped in your incomparable kingdom and wisdom. But, she says, but Lord, you have appointed prayer to obtain answers. Even David the psalmist cried with confident boldness, It is time, O Lord, for you to act. God, on this silent, sunless morning, when I am hedged in on every side, I too cry boldly, You are my Father, and I am your child. So, Lord, could you hurry a little? Would you bow with me for a moment? Father in heaven, we... Thank you that you are a God that's working everything for your perfect will and your perfect timing and your glory. And God, I pray that you would forgive us when we find ourselves being so self-centered. Lord, forgive us when we shake our fist at you and when we wait, but we don't wait patiently. God, I pray you would help us to be watchmen on the wall standing firmly upon your word, waiting to share and to shine the greatness of what you're doing and gonna do 
for your glory. God, help us, your church, to walk in faith, to live by faith even when we don't understand, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it seems the world is crashing all around us, that you would help us to keep on walking by faith according to your word and for your glory. In Jesus' name that we pray today, amen. See?